Good morning and welcome to South Point Church. Is anyone fired up to be here this Easter Sunday? That's what I love about the late services. You guys are always fired up. Hey, I just want to say welcome to those of you watching online. Wherever you might be watching from, I want to say welcome to those of you here in the room. And I always want to say, if this is your first Sunday, either in the room or online, we're so glad that you showed up. We realize that it's a risk to come to a new church. We hope to see you again next Sunday. Uh, By the way, my name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here at South Point. Hey, I really just want to start off with something really, really simple. It's a really, really simple statement that I think Every one of you will understand and kind of can kind of get and, and it, you just prepare yourselves. You ready? Happy Easter! <laughs> it's just simple, right? Ha- happy Easter! Now, whenever you celebrate Easter, or whenever someone tells you Happy Easter, there is kind of this crazy, weird thought that I think everyone has. Listen, it doesn't matter what your status is. You could be single, you could be married, you could be really well off or struggling financially, you could speak a different language, you could come from a different continent. It doesn't matter where you're at in faith, whether you have no faith or different faith. All of us, when we say Happy Easter or celebrate Easter, we kind of have this idea. But you know what? We never, ever really say it out loud in church. And so what I want to do is I want to freak all of you out today. Is that okay? if I freak everyone out today? Yeah, this kid up front, I mean, he's like with me. Yes, I'm with you, right? And so here's kind of this thing that we all think when we're celebrating Easter or someone says happy Easter, we put up here. Sometimes celebrating Easter can feel naive, odd, and even out of touch. And here's why when we say happy Easter or when we celebrate Easter that it can kind of feel naive and odd and, and out of touch. It's because of something that life teaches us that we will never ever forget. This is this unforgettable thing that life teaches all of us no matter where you're at in status, no matter where you're at in faith. Matter of fact, life taught me this lesson and burned it into my soul when I was nine years old. Matter of fact, I can remember the very day it happened. It's like yesterday. I was going to Canterbury Woods Elementary School in Annadale, Virginia. And, you know, this school is a nice little school, but you have to understand it was new to me. Uh, My biological mom, she was sick, and so I'd moved in with my biological dad and my stepmom, who I really didn't know um, any. And so I went to this new school. And in this new school, I was what's called a latchkey kid. It's where both your parents work, and they gave you this little thing on your shoe, and you'd put your key in it. Anybody have one of those things? It was so neat, you'd get beat up every day. That's why no one raised their hand. So I would wear that to school every day, very unexciting, right? And I remember that like you would go to school all day, but because your parents worked late, both of them worked, they would come pick you after school. And you know what kids love? They love going to school all day and then staying afterwards for some more school. (laughs) No, not even close. So I don't know what was going on this day, but I remember it was a beautiful day outside. School had been let out. And so what they usually do is they took us out to the playground and, and we played, right? I remember playing. And then usually around the same time every day, they'd get us all together so that we could go into this room and then our parents would eventually come and pick us up if they still loved us. And I don't know what was going... Yeah, some of y'all caught that, right? And so I don't know what was going on. Like, if anybody knows me, you know I was born a knucklehead, right? And so I'm getting in line, and I don't know if I was cussing at a kid or the teacher. I was probably cussing at both, knowing me, right? But for some reason, something happened, and I just started cussing, cussing at the teacher, cussing at the kid. And then someone yoked me. I don't know. You can't do that anymore. But back in the day, you could yoke a kid. So the teacher came and yoked me by my collar, put me in the back, and said, hey, you're going to straighten up. I'm like, all right, I'm going to straighten up. You know, like, in the back of the line, I'm nine years old, got a bowl haircut and some tough skin jeans, like, just repping, man. Woo! So anyway. So I'm in the back of the line, and so, man, I'm like, man, when my, when my, pe- my dad comes to get me, I'm just going to get in trouble. So we go into this little room, and it had this window that you could look out, and about when your parents would come pick you up, because your parents came about almost the same time every day. So they had this window, and so I, I got up in this window, and I looked out, and I saw my car, but then I was freaked out. You know I was freaked out? Because it was my biological dad and my stepmom. They never came together. I go, oh, man, I'm in trouble. But then there was something weird. They were smiling at me. And I went, did aliens abduct them? And then they came into the room and they waved and they smiled like they were happy to see me. And I was like, what, what's, what's going on? And then they went over and talked to the teacher because when they both came, I thought someone in the school had called them already. Like, let them know that well, they was coming, right? And then uh, that must have not happened because they smiled and they waved at me. And then I saw the teacher go to talk to them. And I mean, the teacher's ratting me out, that mean lady. And then they went into the office and they talked longer. And I said, did I get busted for something else I don't remember doing? Like, I did a lot of things, right? And I was like, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to get in more trouble. And then they all came out. They came to get me, right? They came and got me and they were still smiling. And I said, you know, when your parents are smiling and you know you're in trouble, man, it's going to be, man, you're going to get a whooping, man. I knew I was going to get a big whooping, right? So we get in the car and they're all nice to me, smiling, waving to me in the mirror, talking to me. I'm like, man, what, am I in the twilight zone? And we get home and they give me a really nice dinner. And as dinner's over, I go, is that my last meal? And they said, we need to talk to you. 
I was like, oh, here it comes, man. They're just going to unload. They've been saving it. They've been tricking me. I know it's coming. And they proceeded to tell me that my mom was dead. At nine years old, they said, your mom died of asphyxiation because of the exhaust. And what they didn't tell me was that my mom took her own life. I remember exactly where on the couch I was sitting. I remember where the TV was. I remember where the sliding glass door was. I could feel the room start to spin around me. And I couldn't believe, not only was I not living with my mom, who I loved, she was now gone forever. And it led me to a truth that I experienced early in life, and I'm going to put it up on the screen, and it's this right here. No matter how much we wish or how hard we try, life's uncertainty, chaos, and violence leaves its mark on our lives. And what I discovered, this isn't just true of me. This is true of you. This is actually true of all of us. And if you don't believe me, the last two and a half years have been a vivid reminder that uncertainty and chaos and violence mark our lives. Can I get amen? I mean, we've had a global pandemic, right, that has been uncertain and chaotic and violent. We had racial division that has caused upheaval in our country. We've had political division that's divided family and friends. We have un economic uncertainty that has created damage that none of us want. And there's a violent war on the other side of the world creating a global impact. And here's the thing you already know and the thing that I know. This uncertainty, this chaos, and this violence isn't just something on the outside. It's something that's impacted all of us personally. Because here's my guess, whether you're online or in person, that you've experienced this, that this uncertainty, this, this chaos, this violence has marked your life. Maybe for some of you, this was the year that your parent got Alzheimer's. And when you go to visit them, they don't know who you are, and it breaks your heart. Maybe as I speak about uncertainty and chaos and violence, you're thinking of the addiction that you can't seem to break. You've tried, and you've tried, and you know it creates damage in your life and damage in the life of those you love, but you just can't win. Maybe it's a job loss, this pandemic, this economic uncertainty. And now you're in a place you never thought you'd be in. Maybe you're here and you're a parent. And you got a kid making decisions that harms themselves. And there's nothing you can do to change their behavior. Maybe you're here. And your marriage is in a place you never thought it would be. And see, here's the thing that we all really know. If we could fix it, we We would. And here's the hard truth that life teaches all of us. It doesn't matter your status. It doesn't matter where you're at in faith. Life teaches us the hard truth that we are powerless to fix the uncertainty, the chaos, and the violence on the outside. But the news actually gets worse than we just can't fix the uncertainty and the chaos and the violence on the outside. We realize that we can't fix the uncertainty, chaos, and the violence on the... And it's this powerlessness to fix what is broken on the outside and on the inside that when we say Happy Easter causes us to go, are we naive? Is this odd? Are we out of touch? Until we remember why we even celebrate Easter. Because Easter is the answer to the problem that every human on every continent and every race and every generation faces. That their life will be marked by uncertainty, chaos, and violence. You see, the same uncertainty that marks our lives marked the life of Jesus. You see, this chaos that marks our lives happened to Jesus. And this violence that marks our lives happened to Jesus. But here's the thing. Uncertainty, chaos, and violence mark our lives, but it, it couldn't. Mark Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus flipped the script. Jesus marked violence and chaos, uncertainty, and said, you are defeated. Jesus is the one who conquered what we could not. That's why we say, happy Easter. Amen. You see, listen, we're not here today because of a myth or a fantasy or a fairy tale. We're here because of an historical event that so shook the world that it's still changing lives today. You see, Jesus' message was so unique, it was so different than what we normally expect. Because oftentimes in culture we hear things, but you need to understand Jesus' message wasn't a bunch of things. And here's the message that Jesus didn't give. And sometimes I think the church, we miss this. But I want to put it on the screen, listen. Jesus' message wasn't political propaganda. Say Amen. 
Because I want you to know, those in power don't want to give up power. They want to stay in power and they don't care about us. Political propaganda has never solved anything. Because if it could have, we would have already done it. Jesus didn't come preaching a cultural ideology. Here's the style and the music and the food. He didn't come creating and preaching a cultural ideology. He didn't come with an intellectual mastery saying, listen, if you can grasp this knowledge and know it, then you will be able to conquer uncertainty and chaos and violence. Jesus didn't even come teaching religious rituals. Listen, if this was the message of Jesus, we would have figured it out by now. But I want you to know Jesus came and this was not Jesus' message. And here's why you need to know that the resurrection changed everything. Because people did not carry on a political propaganda or a cultural ideology or intellectual mastery or even religious rituals. You want to know what Jesus' message was? Jesus' message was himself. He said, I am the great I am. I'm the one who will fix everything that is broken. And here's the cool thing. That's not even my idea. It's the words of Jesus. We see it in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of John. We're going to put it on the screen. Here's what Jesus has to say about himself. Jesus told him, he said, I am the way. There is no other way. I am the truth. If you want to see what truth looks like, look at me. And I am the life. Uncertainty and chaos and violence are death, but I am life. You see, Jesus' message wasn't political. Jesus' message wasn't cultural. Jesus' message wasn't intellectual. It wasn't even a religious ritual that he tried to provide. Jesus' message was himself. You see, this is what offended the religious leaders and the political leaders of the day. Jesus said, it is not the religiosity that will save you. It is not your political. It is a personal relationship with the creator of the universe who loves you and is for you. Now, Here's, here's what's crazy, and I'm, I'm about to nerd out on all of y'all, so can you guys stay with me for two minutes? Like, this is who I am. Like, I really want to be a bookworm, but I was the guy who didn't read the books and then read the cliff notes, right? Like, anybody else do that? That was me. But I'm going to nerd out on you for a second, because here's what we often think. We often think, listen, we're here today to talk about the resurrection because the Bible tells us about it. And here, what I need you to know is that is historically and um, it's actually factually incorrect. We don't know about the resurrection because of the Bible. We have the New Testament because the resurrection is true. Matter of fact, there was this guy, his name was Saul, and his name eventually comes to the Apostle Paul, but you have to understand something. History has verified that this guy, Apostle Paul, has lived. Listen, every historian will tell you that the Apostle Paul was a real person who lived on planet Earth. And there's a couple of things that they know about this guy, the Apostle Paul, right? They know that he used to kill Christians and that he became a Christian and began to plant Jesus communities all over the world. The other thing historians know for a fact is that he was martyred or killed for his faith in Jesus somewhere around 67 AD uh, to 72 AD, right? right? Right around the time. And he writes a church a lot like South Point. There were some people there who had no faith, some people who'd grown up a different faith, and some people going to church all their life. And he wants to be crystal clear about what the main message is. And so he writes this in this letter called Corinthians. He writes them, and we're going to see what he writes them. And he, and he says this, he says, I pass on to you what was most important. So he he just wants to make sure it's really good. Listen, I'm going to give you the cliff note versions, nod your head. I'm going to give you the bullet point. Like if there's one thing you need to know, this is just the one thing I'm going to pass on to you. What's most important, which has been passed on me. Christ died for our sins. Jesus took our place for us being knuckleheads. Because the last time I checked, there's no such thing as perfect people. Can I get an amen? If you're here and you're perfect, run. We'll mess you up. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. Do you notice that Paul doesn't say it's a political idea? Do you notice that he doesn't say it's a cultural idea? Do you notice that he doesn't say it's an intellectual idea? Do you notice that he doesn't give you a a religious ritual? He is talking about a person who's conquered hell and death. And then he goes on to say this. Look what he says. He says this in the next part of of his letter. He says, he was seen by Peter. Like, listen, I need you to understand. This isn't some made up idea. He was seen by Peter and then the other 12. And then after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Most who are still alive. And then last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. He's saying, listen, I used to kill Christians until I encountered a risen Jesus. And then I became a Jesus follower. Now, here's what's amazing. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to this church somewhere between A.D. 55 and A.D. 65. Jesus was crucified in 33 A.D. That means it was somewhere right around 30 years when this letter was written. This myth, this legend idea is actually historically incorrect. We don't have the resurrection because of the New Testament. We have the New Testament because of the resurrection 
of Jesus. And the eyewitness accounts of people who saw a risen Jesus. Who didn't carry on a political idea or a cultural idea or a religious idea or an intellectual idea. They carried on the message that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And here's what you might be asking, which is a fair question. What in the world does it have to do with my problem? This problem of uncertainty, this problem of chaos, and this problem of violence that's going to mark my life. What does that have to do with me? And the, and the answer is so good. It's everything. Everything, it has to do with everything. Because here's what I discovered. When you love someone, you will do whatever it takes when uncertainty, chaos, and violence enters their life. If I could go back, when I was nine years old, if I knew what my mom was going through, if there was any way for me to save my mom, I would have out of... And if you're here today, and uncertainty and chaos and violence has wrecked someone in your family, you would do whatever it takes out of love. And that's why we say Happy Easter. Jesus showed up because he was motivated by the thing that motivates us. It was love. It was the love of the Heavenly Father. And here's the good news. That's not even my idea. This is straight Jesus. And now I want to account of the Gospel of John. Here's the words of Jesus. We see it in John 3, 16 and 17. And it says this. For God, this is how God, what? Loved. Listen, if you only hear one thing today online or in person is that there's a God who loves you. And it's for you and died for you. Anyone who would die for you is for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish. You see, when uncertainty and chaos and violence enter our life, it leads to a death. But Jesus says, I've come that you may have eternal life, the kind of life worth living forever. God sent his son into the world not to what the world? See, church, I could preach a whole sermon on just, we should stop judging and just start loving our neighbor. But that's a, that's a different one. But to... Save the world through him. The world isn't saved through politics. The world isn't saved through knowledge. The world isn't saved through religious ritual. The, not, the world isn't saved through cultural ideology. It's saved through a person named Jesus. And here's something, listen, here's something I discovered about life. You know what? We're so good, especially adults, we're so good at taking something simple and making it complicated. Say amen. See, I discovered life is really simple. It boils down to what I call the four Ps. I'm going to put them right up here on the screen. And it's this, is that, that you and me, that all human beings were made for a purpose. We were made to know and enjoy God. We were made to know and enjoy each other, right? Have you ever had one of those days? I mean, one of those days where everything went right. I mean, you didn't burn the food. Say amen. Right? Your kids behaved. Say amen. Your family got along. Say Amen. amen. And then you just, you just, it's one of those days where the weather was beautiful, the food was good, everyone got along, and you go, this is how life is supposed to be. But the reality is that for most of life, it's not the way it should, because there's a problem. The problem isn't just the uncertainty and the chaos and the violence on the outside, because what's on the outside is always a result of what's on the inside. And at some point, every single human being has stiff-armed God. And we said, no, God, we don't want to do it your way. We want to do it our way. And we have a busted and broken world. And if you don't believe me, it's why in our world, little kids get sold into brothels. It's why we hate people who speak a different language and have a different skin color. It's why we steal, kill. It's why we have luxury while others starve. The world is broken. You know it, and I know it. But God had a plan. In the empty tomb, what we celebrate today is the promise that what God can fix on the inside, God someday will come back and fix what is busted and broken on the outside. But this plan is unimaginable. No one saw this plan coming from God. This plan is so ridiculous or redonkulous or however you say it, wherever you come from, that it blew everyone's mind. People today still can't get their mind around it. And we see this unimaginable plan in four simple verses in an encounter that Jesus had. Now you have to understand, when Jesus showed up, he was what's right with the world. You have to understand, Jesus protected the oppressed. Jesus advocated for the marginalized. Jesus healed the unhealable. Jesus, um, he forgave the unforgivable and he loved the unlovable. And you know what he got for it? His disciples betrayed him, abandoned him, denied him, and doubted him. The political and religious leaders together designed to unjustly commit him to more murder and torture him on a cross. Despite four trials that every time he was found innocent. 
And we pick it up on what is called Good Friday. Jesus is on the cross. There's several thieves there. We don't know if there's just two, but there are two are in conversation. And we pick it up, and Dr. Luke, he was, he was this physician who was a great historian, and he recorded it in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Luke, and we pick it up in Luke, and we're going to it, pick it up there, and it says, one of the criminals hanging there beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah. The Messiah is a Jewish word that just means the one who will fix what is broken. Because once you're born in the world and you're over seven years old, you realize that something isn't right. And if it's not sin, what is it? You're the Messiah. You're the one that's going to fix it. Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. This thief, like many of us, when the chaos and the uncertainty and the violence happens, we blame God, my life is what it is because of the chaos and the uncertainty and the violence on the outside. You really should do something. But before Jesus can even respond to this, there's another thief also sentenced to die that day. And he jumps in and we pick it up. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God? Even though you've been sentenced to die, we deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. Four trials, a centurion who says, this is surely the son of God. He was innocent. A thief on the cross six different times. Everybody knows that Jesus isn't there because of what he's done. He's there because he's willingly paying the price for our bustedness and our brokenness, our uncertainty, our chaos, and our violence that lives within. This thief doesn't play the blame game. This thief admits that the uncertainty and the chaos and the violence lives on the inside. And that what's on the inside always shows up on the outside. The next two sentences, I think, are two of the most beautiful sentences in all of eternity. Ever recorded by humankind. Struggling to breathe as they're all asphyxiating to death. The only way they can get air is through the nails that are on a nerve for them to pull up as they scarred back that's been ripped open is rubbing against it to get breath. And the thief says this to Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. A dying criminal whose life has been full of uncertainty and chaos and violence makes a simple request to this one named Jesus. I have nothing to offer other than to surrender to admit my need and to receive whatever you're willing to give and the one who said father forgive them the one who would later say it is finished uttered I think the most beautiful sentence in all of eternity and Jesus replied I assure you some versions say I tell you the truth Today, not tomorrow, not someday, but today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, here's the thing. If the tomb of Jesus and he was still in the tomb, this would be nice. And here's what I've discovered about nice. Nice that doesn't work still fails. But because the tomb of Jesus is empty, These words of Jesus have power. Today you'll be with me in paradise. It's amazing where God would show up. And it leads us to a truth this morning that we're going to put up on the screen. It's it's why we celebrate Easter, and it's this right here. It's Jesus did the unthinkable. You see, we often think that God's up in heaven waiting to scold us when the chaos and the, and the uncertainty and the violence comes out of us. And we often think God's going to scold us. But Jesus did the unthinkable. Instead, he showed up and he sat and he was with these thieves in the most horrific place. See, what we often think of Calvary, we think it's a nice little grassy hill with three nice little crosses. It was a trash dump that had carcasses and urine. The men were naked. Some of them had been on the cross for days. It was one of the most horrific, hellish places on planet Earth. The Romans made sure to make it so distasteful and that's exactly where Jesus chose to show up and I want you to know whether you're online or in the room if there's been uncertainty and chaos and violence Jesus is willing to come and sit with you he did the unthinkable Jesus didn't stay from afar instead he stepped into 
the most horrific thing. Jesus felt the unbearable. It wasn't just the abandonment of his disciples. It wasn't just the betrayal of Judas. It just wasn't the doubt of Thomas and the denial of Peter that broke his heart. It wasn't just the physical torture of the cat of nines that literally ripped the flesh off. Did you know that most men didn't survive the cat of nine tails because you would have so much blood loss? It wasn't that he carried the cross and they pulled out his feet and it kept mashing his face against the ground. It wasn't the pain of his nerves as he pulled up to breathe in his back and he was asphyxiating and suffocating to death. That wasn't the most unbearable painful thing. The most unbearable painful thing is that for the only time in eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit would be separate as Jesus felt the unbearable punishment of the chaos and uncertainty and violence that you and I deserve. Jesus was our substitute. Jesus showed up in the unthinkable way to sit with us. He carried as a substitute the unbearable pain that you and I should carry. But then here's what Jesus did. He gave the undeserved the thief had nothing to offer. And the reality is, is I don't and you don't and we don't have anything to offer God. It's all his already. And he gave this thief whose life was filled with uncertainty and chaos and violence, grace and mercy as a free gift. And it leads us to this truth. And we're going to put it on the screen. And it's this. Yes to Jesus gives us a peace that cannot be stolen. I just want to stop. No matter what happens in the world, the tomb is empty. No matter what happens in my life, in your life, the tomb is empty. You know what that knows? The story has already ended. I know how it's going to end. The same power that rose Christ from the dead, and when he comes back, he's going to fix it. It doesn't matter what happens on this side of eternity. I know how the story ends. That peace cannot be stolen. And then there's a power that cannot be stopped. Did you know that Jesus tells us the same power that rose him from the grave can live inside your heart and our heart. And when we realize that's out of love, love transforms the inside of us so that we live differently. There's a peace and a power that chaos and uncertainty and violence cannot kill or destroy. It gave its best shot to Jesus in the tomb. It's still empty. Which transforms our lives permanently. You see, here's a little bit of bad news. None of us get a pass from life. Jesus says, in this world, you will have troubles. Listen, the uncertainty, the chaos, and the violence is going to happen to all of us. But our life can be defined by the unfailing love of God found in this person named Jesus who conquered what we couldn't. As I close, I think most people miss what is going on in those four verses. There's some undeserving people in a horrific place, on a trash dump, in unimaginable pain. The Romans made sure that it was the closest thing to hell on earth. And here's what's amazing about that, is that God showed up. And it's not that just God showed up in that moment. God bore the same pain that they did. And that Jesus showed up in the middle of those lives, in the middle of their uncertainty and the chaos and the violence that was killing them and bringing death. So that they could know that there was a God who made them and a God who loved them and a God who would die for them but not stay dead in a tomb. He is forever risen. And just like in that moment in history and time that God showed up, I believe whether you're online or in person, that God has you here today for this specific moment. Because all of us will respond. Because a love like what Jesus demonstrated is worthy of a response. And I wonder which thief we'll be like today. Will we be like the thief who plays the blame game on the chaos and the uncertainty and the violence on the outside? Or will we be like the thief who admits that the uncertainty and the chaos and the violence lives on the inside? And will surrender and in not being able to do anything, just receive the gift of love found, not in a church, not in a pastor, not in political, not in religion, but in a person named Jesus. You have two sheets that were on your chair when you came in. The first one is a smaller sheet. It's for those of you here today that say, listen, Maybe you go, listen, I knew about Jesus. I even acknowledge that God exists. 
but I've never fully surrendered. I've never said I'm going to put Jesus first in every area. And maybe today is the day. Like when Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today is the day where you cross over from death to life and you surrender. And instead of having your life marked by uncertainty or chaos or violence, you'll say yes to Jesus. All you have to do is put your first name only. We want to create a moment. There's a cross out in the lobby for you just to have a moment with you and your heavenly father to receive the gift that Jesus gave us and put it on that cross. The second is a little bit larger. It's a way for us to help you con connect and take next steps because without next steps, we stay stuck. You see, it's so simple to say yes to Jesus. You just admit that you got it wrong. You believe he, he is who he says he is and he did what he did. And then you commit to putting him first. It's not about perfection. And you can give these to the ushers as you leave. And maybe you've already made that decision. Maybe you've already fully surrendered. You just check A or type A in the chat. Maybe you're here today or online and you're still considering and you'll just check C. Maybe you're here today and someone brought you here and said, there's a funny looking dude up front. You should come see him. You could just check D, I don't think I'm interested, or type that in the chat. But I want to challenge you to be like the second thief today. Because today is the day of salvation. Where with open hands and nothing to offer, we would say, Jesus, remember us when you come into your kingdom. We will receive your unfailing love and your goodness and the price that you paid so that we could experience life. We'd like to create a moment for you to process that and make that decision. So the worship team is going to lead us in worship. May you and I experience Christ in this.